faithful man who will be able to teach. Remember what I mentioned yesterday for those of you that were in the uh, preachers and uh, pioneers workshop is that the first thing I look at when I look at a text are the verbs. Those are the action words. Those are the things that we need to be doing. And so you'll notice in verse 2, three important verbs. And the things which you have heard, verb number one, listening, uh, commit these, second verb, commit, and third, teach, teach others also. We're going to look at that in a moment. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must, first, uh, must be first to partake of the crops. <clears throat> Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, but be diligent to present yourselves. Approve to God a worker who does not need uh, to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that's just an example of how rich these uh, books are, every line. And when you write a letter to somebody, uh, you know, you don't just write a blather there. Everything you say has meaning and importance. And so uh, when you read these books, uh, I don't expect revelation from each and every word, but there's going to be elements of those books that are going to really speak to your life and give you some <coughs> correction, guidance, revelation, and so forth. And so I want you to focus on that and be prepared next week to be called on to share with us what God spoke to you about. So leadership. Uh, again, we've dealt with this subject a lot. It continues to be uh, the greatest need and the greatest challenge of our church and our congregation. Uh, it is one of the most important facets of church life, that, and that is producing leaders. Producing responsible, faithful, diligent, disciplined leaders that, who live their lives outside of themselves. They primarily live their lives for the benefit of others. There's a leadership vacuum in our world, certainly. I mean, you look at the political arena, the judicial system, uh, the educational system, and uh, other uh, institutions, and there is certainly a leadership uh, vacuum in our world today. Uh, there is a leadership vacuum in the church world. And there's a leadership vacuum here locally in our congregation as we're trying to cultivate uh, more and more men to provide leadership. There's reasons for it. Uh, one of the great culprits today, and of course I've mentioned this uh, uh, on numerous occasions, one of the great culprits uh, of uh, this leadership vacuum is fatherlessness. Uh, you learn, you're supposed to learn a lot about leadership from watching your father lead. Love his wife, earn money, uh, carry out his duties and responsibilities that, uh, faithfully. And one of the things that we've said in these leadership classes is that every man is, by virtue of the fact that you are a man, you're all called to be leaders in one way or another. If you're a single man, a married man, a teenager, by virtue of your manhood, uh, you have natural attributes or should have natural attributes that that should be the process of being cultivated that will drive you to a position of leadership which is serving, wielding influence, that, uh, and we'll get to some of those uh, specifics. Uh, and I think that our church uh, in specific, our culture uh, in general, is crying out for leaders. 
uh, and they are not being produced in very many places. You look at our college campuses today, the state of our uh, college campuses today, the state of the millennial generation, young people, youth today. Uh, and it doesn't take very much to observe that uh, leaders are not being produced, men are not being challenged. Uh, and it, as a matter of fact, the church, I think the church, my opinion is, that the church uh, is the only place where the quality of leadership that is needed is going to be raised up because it's not just attributes of leadership. I mean, there's, there's you know, NFL coaches, college football coaches that are good leaders. They have character, they can motivate men and so forth. But, but uh, when it comes to uh, integrity of righteousness, relationship with God, and, and projecting through your life God's kingdom, and God's virtue, of course, there's no other place that, uh, for that but the church uh, uh, of Jesus Christ. So we're going to focus on verse 2. Look at it with me. Uh, verse 2 of uh, chapter 2. The things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So understanding uh, that part of his ministry uh, was to be given to this task of leadership. Paul is giving very clear instruction about how leadership is to be projected and how it's to be communicated and how uh, virtue and attribute uh, are to be uh, imparted. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, just another verse from 2 Timothy in the previous chapter, uh, verse 10 says, but uh, has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. We're going to look at that dynamic of appointed to which I was appointed a preacher, apostle, teacher of the Gentiles. So today I want to just look at some principles of leadership and there's a basic <coughs> premise Again, that you're, you, you would be familiar with if you've been coming to these classes any length of time. And that is that nothing of significance is going to be achieved in life without the presence of leadership. The idea of the solo pilot in the kingdom of God is not biblical. We labor in conjunction with each other as the body of Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ in fellowship with the brethren uh, underneath the oversight and the guidance of the leadership that God has provided for us. You will achieve nothing unless you learn to properly relate to leadership, properly submit to leadership. Uh, you'll, you'll never become anything in and of yourself. And then once you, uh, uh, well, you won't be able to aspire to leadership without first properly processing leadership in your own life. If you can't submit, if you always want to argue, if you've always got a better idea, uh, then if you ever do manage to get yourself in a position of leadership, you're not going to be able to cultivate faithfulness and loyalty to your vision. Because you didn't, you didn't exhibit it to the vision that, uh, was placed over you. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if you can't be faithful with another man's, God will not give you your own. So that's where it all uh, begins. And again, this is true in every facet of life. And there's no substitute for this. Uh, there's no alternative for this. We know that in business, leadership. In sports, there's a coach, there's a leader. In warfare, uh, there is a structure of command, there's authority, there's leadership. Uh, and certainly this is true uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ. You'll hear, uh, you may hear rebels, and they are rebels, who will talk about uh, the priesthood of every believer. Uh, that is a, a code word for rebellion, is what it is. When you hear someone ask you, uh, do you believe in the priesthood of every believer? That means every believer is a priest, leader, authority, don't need a pastor, don't need to submit, uh, we can decide. So the, the person who first uh, asked me that question, 
uh, happened to be a business owner, and I said to him, why don't you try running your business that way? Somebody's got to be in charge if anything's going to be achieved and accomplished. You can't have employees coming in thinking that they're at the same level as the boss and they can determine how things ought to be run. Uh, and all of you uh, are going to, or can, at least potentially benefit from good leadership. Whether you benefit from leadership or not depends on how you relate, whether you can submit, be corrected, and so forth. Uh, but you're going to benefit from good leadership if your heart uh, is right. We know the scripture in Acts chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, but we know that, uh, that there was a problem in the church. And Peter and the other pastor said, seek out from among you seven men whom we may appoint over this business. In other words, they looked around, you, 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 seven men, honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, with wisdom, that they could put in a position of leadership to oversee a certain area of ministry uh, in that congregation. And so that if they didn't have those men, imagine, if they didn't have those men, uh, either the problem doesn't get solved or the pastor has to do something uh, that he shouldn't have to be doing. He needs to be praying uh, and studying the Word of God and, and, and investing himself in the ministry uh, and then under him, other leaders need to rise up. And if there are no leaders to appoint to those sorts of uh, uh, challenges, then the church will cease to grow, and the church will cease to uh, be fruitful. And so men have to be found that can aspire to leadership, rise to leadership, and then be appointed. Uh, if that uh, is the case, that's what is said in the text that I read that Paul refers to himself as having been appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Now we know that that appointment came from God, but it had to be recognized by others, had to be cooperated with uh, by others that were there. And so that, uh, that word, or that term to be appointed uh, uh, means that we have a task, we have challenges, preach the gospel, raise disciples, and, and provide uh, leadership for the needs of the ministry of the local church, and perhaps if you're called to preach, obviously, uh, beyond that. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and 16, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a, set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men that he may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So that's how, that's a leadership verse. That's how God seeks to use our lives. Now I know that's spoken in the context of every believer, and I believe that's true, that every believer, by virtue of their conversion, can wield influence and provide guidance, help, and leadership. Uh, but I think that also specifies, or can specify, the type of leadership. We're looking for you men to be lights that can be looked to for guidance, for example, for direction, uh, and for uh, influence. So let's look then specifically at the imagery of the text that's here. And I wanted to spend a few moments because it clarifies for us in a very powerful way some of the dynamics of leadership that you men need to be thinking about. Uh, and first of all, he refers to faithfulness, only faithful men will be able to carry out the responsibilities of leadership that are required. Chief of which is being an example to others, and I'll get to that in a minute, but faithfulness. In the context of our congregation, that's faithfulness to be in every service, faithfulness to be in prayer meeting. There are people in our church, I've been here 24 years pastoring this church, and there are regular church attenders, members of our congregation, that I have never seen in a prayer meeting. 24 years. You can't do that. Your presence in prayer meeting provides leadership, just by virtue of being faithful. Uh, and I don't think you appreciate your longevity in the congregation, your stability. When new converts get saved, they notice you. Because you're moving around, you're serving, you're ministering, you're doing whatever it is you're doing, you're showing up every service, and new converts see that. 
They see your faithfulness, and without you saying a word, your presence sends a message, and so does your absence. I talked about that uh, last Sunday morning. Uh, and so leadership begins with uh, faithfulness. And in the context of your faithfulness, uh, three things are highlighted here in the text. Uh, first of all, he says, uh, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, those things that you have heard from me. You are responsible for everything that you hear, at least in the context of, of what flies over this pulpit, what is presented in the context of a sermon, a message, correction, instruction, advice, counsel, wisdom that, that comes from the pastor. Your response, those things that you have heard. So he's expecting that Timothy is taking seriously what Paul has been saying. You're responsible for what you hear. You don't have the luxury of dismissing what you don't like. Leadership is about being challenged. It's about a high level of faithfulness. It's about sacrifice and paying a price. And all of that is in the context of you hearing, taking seriously of what you're hearing and putting it into practice in your life. Jesus emphasized over and over again, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. There's an emphasis because this is how revelation is communicated. It's not communicated by mental telepathy or by text. It's communicated through the preaching of God's word, through communication, verbal communication and interaction. And everything that you need to hear and be responsive to may not come from this pulpit. It could come in the context of uh, a meeting in the office or a conversation that uh, I may have with you that is in the context of ministry or correction uh, uh, or instruction or guidance or something uh, uh, in that context. So you better pay attention. Disciples and leaders have to be very good uh, listeners. If you're called to leadership in the church, if you're accountable to everything that you hear that pertains to truth, Revelation, instruction, correction, guidance. Jesus said in Mark 4, 24, take heed what you hear. This is a warning. Take heed. Every time Jesus said take heed, it's a warning. Take heed what you hear with the same measure that you use. So you're expected to use what you hear. Put it into practice. With the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you. So in other words, if you hear, put it into practice, God will give you more. And to you who hear, more will be given. Whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. You're going to lose it. If you hear something significant and you don't put it into practice, you don't take it seriously, it, it falls off the radar. It, you know, it's like um, a Snapchat. It just goes away after a little while. And you forget it. And it's amazing how flippant we can be uh, with what we hear. You hear a sermon, you're expected to put the revelation of that message into practice, to seal it at the altar, call, uh, establish it as something that you're going to take possession of it and express in your life. Leaders have, have to take very seriously what they hear. And again, this is uh, uh, what the Apostle Paul is saying. Secondly, uh, he says, uh, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit. So he's expecting what you hear to be a possession that you can then pass on to someone else. Uh, the word commit there means to deposit or to entrust something to one's charge. And so not everyone hears to the degree that they can commit what they've heard into the hands of somebody else. This, this is about you communicating the revelation that God has given you by you hearing and embracing truth uh, and revelation. And it's possible, again, to lose very critical and very crucial 
truth and revelation and things that you should be imparting simply because uh, you're not putting it into practice. God is not ministering to you just to minister to you. He's ministering to you so that you can give it to others. What you're learning. How many of you have ever, you know, had a conversation with someone and you've said to them, didn't you hear what Pastor Priest said something? Right? They, they, they've forgotten it or they weren't paying attention or they were off to the bathroom. They weren't listening or they weren't there, maybe. Uh, you heard it. You got it. And now you're in a position where you can impart that to somebody else. To, you have to listen and then you have to do your diligence to, to make an effort to take what you heard and put it in the hands of of uh, somebody else. And then thirdly, he uses the term teach. This is a very powerful uh, expression in the Word of God and a very high level of responsibility. Let's read it all together. Uh, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So you're hearing, you're committing, they're receiving, and then they're going off and teaching others. This is how uh, leadership wields impact. And it's evident here that Paul is not expecting to be the sole arbiter of truth and revelation. He's expecting Timothy to do his part. He's expecting Timothy to find faithful men to uh, commit truth and revelation to them, and then those faithful men uh, teaching others uh, also. Uh, so here's a powerful uh, progression that is triggered from here, from the pastor, released among leaders. Then those leaders uh, take and uh, put in the hands of others what you've learned, and then they're able to teach others also. Uh, this is how growth in our fellowship is uh, realized. Pastor Mitchell doesn't wield influence uh, uh, directly by conversation and contact and preaching, but others do. We've received what he said. We're passing it on, and then you're taking it, and you're passing it on. And our fellowship now has probably 10 or 12 generations of churches that have been planted, and then those churches have planted, those churches have planted, and it's spread uh, all throughout the world. And this is a very powerful principle of leadership that we lead by example, both in character and in practice, uh, and there's no limit to the dimension uh, of truth, revelation, and spiritual life that can be imparted uh, if you will simply do your part. And I wonder how much of this is going on in your life. How much uh, committing are you doing in your relationships as a leader? I mean, that's the assumption here, I'm assuming, serious man leaders. That's what these guys want. So who are you taking truth uh, that you've heard putting it into somebody else, uh, and then encouraging them to pass it along to somebody else. Some of it will be a natural progression, but it's something that you need to think about because it has to be proactive. It's not going to be automatic. Leaders that look for opportunity. They look for people that they can speak to and minister to. I spend my whole day, well, all my waking life, I do have a little bit of downtime, but I'm constantly thinking of, about who I can call, communicate with, talk to, speak to. Uh, and uh, this is a constant uh, uh, effort that needs to be exhibited. And this is your challenge to hear, to commit, and to encourage others to teach what you're putting in their hands. And the church can only grow to the degree that leaders will rise up. Someone asked uh, uh, us the other day, I was in... Uh, I can't remember where I was, but the question was about why are so many of our churches stuck at 30 to 50 people or so? And there, that is true. A lot of our churches all around the world grow to about 30 to 50, and that's it. Well, I don't know all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I know one thing is discipleship. If you're going to grow beyond 30 to 50, you better have some men that, that can project your convictions and and, and to project what you're doing into the lives of that body of congregation and can provide leadership, provide service and ministry. You have to have disciples for church growth. We don't do personality cults. We don't set up churches and videotape me preaching elsewhere. We, we raise disciples to do that. So uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today. So let's bow our heads. Every uh, serious men's class 
should be a uh, moment of making some decisions in your life because you're being challenged specifically and directly about how you're going about living your life, the decisions that you're making, uh, and this should be a constant. That's why we can revisit subjects like leadership because there's always new men that are coming and there's always men that may be slacking off a little bit uh, or if you're doing right in this regard, uh, you can reestablish and reaffirm these very important uh, truths and principles. So I want you to think about these four attributes, faithfulness and how much impact that has. Even without you saying a word, your faithfulness sends a very powerful message to everyone else in the congregation. And then, of course, the dynamics of our text, hearing, committing, and teaching. I know you're busy. You have jobs, you have wives, you have children, you have responsibilities and so forth. But if you're going to lead, if you're going to be a man of God in your own right, then you have to give a portion of your life to the church and providing the leadership that she needs. Because she needs you, I can tell you that for sure. Amen. Father, let's pray. Just pray together. Pray on your own. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the grace of God that has been made sufficient to our lives today.
you know, so many of our guys just don't appreciate, people in our church don't appreciate what we have. You know, a lot of, you know, maybe newer members or even maybe some of you, you just think that every church is like this. And where I could go to here, I could go to here. <coughs> Doesn't mean we're the only ones. We never ever say we're the only church. We don't believe we are. There's other churches in El Paso that preach the gospel, but there is a unique dimension to what we have, and you should value it and appreciate it and not be ashamed to say, thank God for what we have here at the door and in our fellowship. Because it is unique, and the resource you guys have is incredible. Uh, you know, I'm, I told the men yesterday, uh, my responsibility, if you're called to preach, is to facilitate your calling. You're just not going to find that anywhere. You're not. We bank you, we send you, we support you, we fly you wherever you need to go, bring you back for a couple. You know, the, the support mechanism of our fellowship is unique in the world today. And, uh, and the support and the outreach and the quality of preachers that can come in and preach for you. And Mother Church covers the cost of that, all the dynamics that are involved. So uh, that needs to be valued as you insinuated. Yes, Juan. I remember one time you said uh, a couple months back that um, no matter what, we are discipling somebody. Whether there's someone on your left or your right, you are discipling somebody. Whether you're discipling them for righteousness or you're discipling them for destruction. And it, and it, it, it it's me because you have to be careful of how you lead and what you say. And like you said, there is people watching you. And, yeah. and they want to embrace or they, or one time you said, do you see a hero in the church? Do you look at somebody and say, well, I want that. I, I want I want to embrace that spirit. I, I want to be there or be better. And then another thing I wanted to say about what you mentioned about faithfulness is with like many and Eric. So he witnessed to him 10, 15 years ago. And what if many wasn't here no more? Yeah. He would have came, he came to the church looking for him. Many witnessed to me too. If he would have left or whatever, we have our seasons. And sometimes you hear the voices and can I do this who I want it? But the Spirit of God is in us and says we need to proceed. Yeah, I mean, you would have been expected to live for God whether Manny is here or not, but because Manny's here, it makes it easier for you. Correct. You have a reference point. You have somebody to follow, and that always makes it uh, easier. We can help others. If you're, you know, if you're just living for yourself, it's your job, your family, your situation, your circumstances, uh, that's not the will of God for a man. You have to be living outside the boundaries of your own interests helping and serving and ministering to the needs of others. Amen. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, so Pastor, I wanted to say, like, uh, I think leadership uh, to me was very important because when I came to church, like, now, you know, on our days, like you said, that the father is generation, I didn't have a father to teach me how to work or anything, you know, and my mom, she, she had everything for me, yeah. you know? So, and I remember when I came into church, it was the, the men of God that challenged me, like, hey, you know what, man? You need to get a job, man. They're like, you need a job. You need a job? I was like, you got a job? You know? And I think it's very important for especially, like, the older men. To See, that's the issue right there. Yeah. All these guys, young men like this, and some of them are not so young. They're 30 years old and still living with mom. They need to be told they haven't had a dad. And so that, that's how it brings up. And just that what you're saying about what we have here, you know, we have a wonderful fellowship and a, a wonderful uh, bunch of leaders in our fellowship, but, you know, I've been saved for 31 years, been in a different part of the fellowship as well. And what we have here, and I'll pass I told that to this pastor, because we're trying to get to see the here It's an amazing work, an amazing situation here in El Paso. And all the men that are here and, and the wealth of resources and knowledge of, of uh, revivals in the past and revivals now and present. You can sit down with Pastor, you can sit down with Pastor GC and these men in this in this uh, room today and ask them to pick their brain. And if you're not doing that as a young disciple, you're here you want to preach, you're, you're crazy because uh, not everybody has this. And very few people have what we have today. Thank you, George. <coughs> yes. Pastor, my question is, so with me, I grew up in the church. And Pastor Glenn, I remember going to um, a youth Bible study, and he was playing chess, and I didn't talk to him at all or anything like that. And he said, do you want to learn about this game? And I was like, yeah, so he invited me to his office. And then and he then, married his daughter. <laughs> 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 and so he knew that was going to happen. <laughs> My question is, 
for you to be a part of a lot of my life. Um, there's other people here. But it was over a chess game. Now, my question is to you, if I'm going, does it everything have to no, be spiritual? No, I don't play chess. Or... <laughs> the majority of what you get from me is going to be through my preaching okay. and this kind of a setting. I can't sit down with all of you all the time. <laughs> you know, George came to my office yesterday. We had a chat for a period of time. I can make room for that, but I don't have the time. You know, Jesus, even with the 12, he had three that were closer than the others, you know, that he... Uh, invested in Peter, James, and John, so I can't, well, I can't play chess with all of you. Uh, I can respond to requests, and you can do your own opportunities, but the majority of what you get from me is going to be in this context, preaching sermons, teaching in this series, men, uh, preachers and pioneers workshop, and then when you can catch me or make an appointment or we can go out for coffee, those sort of things, but you have to make those opportunities yourself. So... You as, maybe as you as a pastor or a leader or something like that, you usually influence people through what you preach instead of trying to get a one-on-one? -on -one Primarily. Okay. I mean, I never spent time with Pastor Warner. The whole time I was being disciple. I went to his house in a non-formal way, I think, once. You know, for fellowship and uh, so forth. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, but that's not, that's not the primary means. It can be a means, it can contribute, and I try to make room and respond. If someone calls and says, hey, we get together, I'll try to work it out. Angel. I think in a pioneer setting, um, it's probably critical because it's the opportunity to have. You to well, have the pioneer room, setting, that's the bread and butter. The, the, the room for that, and so anything that you can do to try to reel these guys in and be able to influence them. Yeah. Uh, of course, you're not going to sit there and play chess and, you know, the wee hours of the night. But maybe, maybe chat, checkers. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> or peace. No, but you're absolutely right. When you're building a church, that is the bread and butter. But every off night in London, I was driving around with my son Joe, visiting people in the church, talking to them, getting together with them in fellowship. That's how I built the church, sitting in their living room and trying to get them inspired by being in church. Angel Ortiz. I was going to say the same thing, that in the pioneer setting, you actually find something in common to spend some time with them and be right. part with them, because once you do, you know, uh, I mean, you, you don't, you know, you, it's, even in different cultures, you have nothing in common with these people. And, and so I, I actually became a baseball coach. And, you know, I, I just started coaching these kids. I didn't know what they were and, you know, who they were. And we started playing a game, and before you know it, there's 30 kids. And and so I then You're I talking preached, about Puerto Rico. Yeah, Puerto Rico. Yeah. Then I preached to them and they all came to church, they all got saved, and then they asked me, Are you coming tomorrow? I was like, and so before you know it, I'm I'm playing baseball with them <laughs> and bringing all their friends, their older brothers, their parents to church and, and you just find something in common, you yeah. know. And uh, in a pioneer, pioneer setting it's totally different. Yeah, pioneer. So so that what they what Angel and Angel are talking about and, and uh, Raymond the getting together, the playing chess, and that's what you guys should all be doing. I'm not saying playing chess specifically, but you understand what I mean? That, that's business that you guys can get together with people and inspire them and help them along the way, where I can't do that. I have limitations just like everybody else does. Uh, but that's, uh, that, that is spread through, uh, through discipleship. I'm going to add to that. One of the things that I pray for as far as the baby churches is that they're able to raise the pillars that will do that. So once it gets to a certain point that the pastor can do this, the pillars should be able to step in right. and encourage them and do that. Yeah, that's why if you're running 30 to 50 and you have one disciple, you're on your way. One man who's faithful, you can call him and say, hey, I need you to follow up. I need you to go see this. But you can start getting them to do what you would do if you didn't have it or if you were smaller. So very good. <coughs> okay, one more. Rick. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the issue of fatherlessness. Yeah. That kind of hit home. Uh, but uh, you said you learn leadership by watching your father. And one of the scriptures that came to mind is 1 uh, Corinthians 11, where Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah. And you said he didn't spend a whole lot with Pastor Warner, but I see the same a lot of qualities. Pastor Warner reflected in your preaching and, yeah. and, and everything that you do. I, I see that embodiment of that reflected in your life. Yeah, and we become fathers, uh, you know, uh, Gabriel may not have had a father growing up, 
But he has numbers of fathers now. People that men that are older, longer in the kingdom of God, have something to say, provide instruction, and he's responding to all that. So uh, that's a powerful dimension. All right, let's all stand. Thank you for being here. I do want to say, for those of you that were in the Preachers and Pioneers workshop, that uh, being here is a requirement also. So if you're going to be in the next Preachers and Pioneers workshop, you have to be faithful in these serious men's classes, and I obviously will have to make that announcement in church because some that were the preachers and pioneers workshop aren't here this morning and I'm not going uh, to tolerate that so uh, you have to be faithful to both pioneer workshop and serious man if you're called to preach and then in this setting uh, serious man anyone who's uh, can come even if you're, if you're, whether you're called to preach or not so. alright let's thank God worship him and then I'm going to ask if Jesus would close and pray thank God